Hi, Julia Usher, Recipes for a Sweet Life. If you've been following my channel for any time now, you know that I'm as much of a chocolate fan as I am a fan of cookies. So I couldn't go another week without creating a chocolate project for you. I've got a great one that I think is gonna be perfect for your Valentine. It's chocolate from head to the very tip top of the chocolate bow down to toe to the very bottom of this chocolate pedestal. The chocolate pedestal, solid chocolate, the domed part is solid chocolate, and all the elements on top are modeling chocolate. With accents of purple and lavender, they make a wonderful edible Valentine's gift. So let's talk about what you'll need. For the top of the pedestal, I'm just using the lid of a container. This is the lid of one of my fondant containers. It's plastic and chocolate sets beautifully in plastic and will pop right out. I do have a whole host of silicone molds though. They come in big broad sheets and I often cut them down for use in projects and for demonstrating in videos. So this hemisphere was part of a much bigger sheet for making molded desserts. And then I've got these fluted dessert molds which will either fill with mousse or we might just conceal some other chocolate treats inside under that dome. For this project you need chocolate of course. I would suggest either coating chocolate or tempered real chocolate for this project. To melt it, we're gonna be working with a double boiler setup. Mine's kind of a makeshift bowl and a saucepan. Lastly, for decorating the, the pieces, we're gonna make a really jazzy pedestal by stenciling it, and I'm gonna be using some frosting sheets, which is an edible paper, punching them with craft punches of two varieties to create patterns. We're gonna be stenciling over that paper with a little bit of pearl luster spray, and then removing the stencils to reveal a pattern. And then lastly, for the trim on the sides of the pedestal and also up top, you'll need various types or colors, I should say, of modeling chocolate. I've got different colors here, a lavender, a pink, a green, and normal dark chocolate for the bow loop. So you want a variety of colors quite possibly for this project as well. My first step is to mold the top of the pedestal using the lid from my fondant container as the mold. And I'm gonna use dark chocolate for all of the pedestals. So this is just a solid dark chocolate. I'm gonna be mixing a little bit of this with white chocolate to create a lighter shade for the fluted dome. Now this molding process is pretty straightforward. The key thing is I just wanna keep the chocolate level. So I'm gonna be piping it in in a circular motion and then shaking it so that it's as level as possible. So I have a nice straight piece to go on top later. So using my handy parchment cones, You'll notice how fluid and flowing the chocolate is. That's because I didn't overheat it or get any water in it. If you have a very thick chocolate, chances are you did either of those two things. So do review my melting of chocolate video because it goes into great detail about how to properly melt chocolate. And I just cut my parchment tip in there, which you don't want to do. So I'm going to pipe in a relatively circular motion trying to get even coverage, but do that really quickly because this, this coating chocolate will set fast particularly if your room is cool. And we wanna give that a nice shake. So this will be probably no more, given the depth of the lid, no more than an eighth, an eighth of an inch thick. So still pretty thin. Now, coating chocolate, what I'm working with, will set at normal room temperature. I'll just pop that bubble before it does. But if you wanna accelerate the process, you can pop it in the fridge, which we're gonna do. If you're gonna do that, I recommend only doing it ever so briefly because if it sits in the fridge too long, it collects moisture and it has a dulling effect on the chocolate. It won't pop out quite as shiny. Okay, so while that piece is setting, I'm gonna go ahead and mold the fluted top using my lighter chocolate, which again is a mixture of dark chocolate and white chocolate, and this fluted mold. One thing to note about molds, you wanna make sure they're absolutely completely clean before you use them because if they're wet on the inside or have any grease on the inside, that's gonna be an area that's gonna show up as a dull spot when you unmold it. Mine's looking pretty clean. Now this mold has some very deep areas down at the bottom. And if I were just to dump chocolate in there and then unmold it, I, I probably wouldn't get chocolate all the way into those very deep areas and I'd end up with little holes on top like I have here. I wanna to try to avoid those holes as much as possible and end up with something that looks more like this. So I'm gonna show you how I do that. I do that in two steps. These, I should say, are not solid chocolate molds. They're hollowed out inside as well, so we can use them to cover other chocolates or to fill with mousse. So I'm just gonna start by pumping the light chocolate deep into those areas, getting my tip down deep in them. And then I can just be less 
I can be just much more loose with the application of chocolate. I'm actually going to spoon in another tablespoon. So I've got about a couple tablespoons in this mold, which is about three inches in diameter. And I'm just going to spoon it, just kind of work the chocolate all the way up to the upper edge with the spoon, kind of spread it around. You can be kind of rough with this. I want to get it all the way up to the edges to start. Then I'm going to turn it down, upside down over the pan. Shake, 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 shake for a little bit. Then turn it upright, take a spatula and clean off all this stuff on top because that'll create a foot. If you let it set with all that mess around it, you'll have a really rough bottom and we want a really nice neat bottom. Now I'm going to set that actually in the fri fridge to quick set it so that the chocolate, whatever is residing in there, doesn't drip all the way to the bottom too fast. So there's a third piece to this project, which is the base of the pedestal, which I mold with my two and three eighths inch hemisphere mold. And I mold it in a manner that's very similar to how I did the light chocolate top, except there's no need to pipe anything into any deep recesses because there are none in here. So I'm just going to spoon it in back to my dark chocolate to match the top of the pedestal. I'm just going to spoon it in and kind of spread it around and then let it drain out over the pan. You could also put this in the fridge to set upside down as you could with the fluted one. More drainage to the bottom would occur, leaving less chocolate density at the top once it comes out. But I don't like to do that so much because I end up with a rougher bottom edge. So I prefer to forego that step, maybe have slightly thicker chocolate in this area by setting it this way as opposed to upside down, but I'll have a much cleaner bottom edge if that makes sense. So I'm gonna let the excess drain out. And then once again, just try to scrape off what I can so that's nice and clean along this edge and then get it promptly into the fridge or freezer to quick set. Okay, so we're ready to unmold just a few minutes in the freezer and a little bit longer if you're gonna use the fridge to quick set them or alternatively at room temp. Just wanna make sure it's firm all the way through. And if it easily separates from the mold, it's ready to come out. I'm just gonna invert it directly onto a cake cardboard and you can see how beautifully shiny it is. If I had left it in the fridge or freezer too much longer, that would have come out a little cloudy and dull. So that's why I like to move quickly on these. The unmolding of this one, now just a, a note, you'll see that I talked a little bit and I had to walk to get it to the freezer and in that time some of the chocolate slid down so I have much thinner walls towards the bottom than I do at the top. So that would be motivation if you have a long walk to the freezer for setting it upside down instead of right side up. But these silicone molds are pretty forgiving. I just roll them back basically very carefully. And even if you have a thin edged dome, you can get it out quite nicely. And because I piped the chocolate down deep into those grooves, I didn't get too many holes. I have a couple of small ones here, but nowhere else. And in the reality, I can easily cover those with flowers and leaves, so we're not going to see much of that. But if you weren't, you would want to really take extra care to make sure you're getting that chocolate way down deep into those grooves. Chocolate hemisphere, same situation. This is fresh out of the freezer. Just pull back the mold. If there's any roughness to the bottom of this, no worries. We are actually going to be trimming it out with modeling chocolate as well, so that'll all be hidden, and that's beautifully shiny. So. All this can be hidden. You can also run a hot knife blade over the edge to kind of smooth some of that out if you're fussy. The next step is getting pattern on my pedestal. I want it to be kind of jazzy because the top part is going to be relatively simple. To get the stenciled pattern on the chocolate, I like to work with frosting sheets for a couple of reasons. A, they're conformable, so when I stencil on the dome, they're going to conform nicely to the dome so I won't get any underspray. But also there's sugar in them so that if they get slightly moist, they're a little bit tacky and I can get them to stick onto the chocolate, with usually without adding any corn syrup, especially on flat pieces. There's a little bit of tackiness to them, natural tackiness to them. For the domed surfaces, I might have to tack them with a little corn syrup towards the bottom of the piece so it's not dead center. Uh, on this piece, I'm, I just used this two inch scalloped round for the center. I wanted to leave the center pretty clear of pattern so that I can place desserts there without smudging the stenciling because even if I were to touch this now, I stenciled this earlier, sometimes you can smudge it. So I want an area in the center that's relatively free and clear and this is sticking down nice and flush to it. I don't think it'll blow off under 
spraying while being sprayed just by pressing it lightly down. For the edges, I used a slightly different punch. These are all craft store tools. I love applying craft tools to cooking projects. It creates an element of surprise that you might not expect otherwise. So I'm going to punch out a few of these and cut them down to different sizes to create the pattern around the edge. So for this edging, I need eight little portions of this. I'm just going to cut them into each one into thirds, more or less, to create this edge pattern. And try to fit them a little bit off. I noticed, just given the sizing of this disc, that if I set them a little bit off the edge, I can get eight around pretty easily. You could leave the edible paper on here, but it's kind of chewy and pasty. So I'm just using it for a stencil. I don't want to stick them down if I don't have to, because the easier they come up, the better. They are coming off in the end. So that's the stenciling approach. I would essentially do the same thing on the dome. I'm not going to stencil it for you. What I did here was I, I put these pieces up vertically like so and just worked them to fit the sides of the dome and went all the way around in that fashion. So once again, ready to spray with my backdrop and my paper towel protecting my surface with PME Luster Spray. I've got a pearl spray, which is gonna look kind of silvery when it goes down onto something dark. This is great for spraying on chocolate because it's alcohol-based and it evaporates really quickly. If you were to use a water-based color on chocolate, it would, it would tend to dull the chocolate and leave spots. This is gonna dry nearly instantaneously. Give it a good shake. And I'm gonna spray from top down. I don't really wanna get the sides on this because I'm gonna be sticking some modeling chocolate to the sides and it'll stick more easily if I don't have spray on it. Test on my work surface. And I'm using broad circular motions at pretty great distance because this has a tendency to pool up very quickly on the chocolate. And that looks good. Unlike stenciling with an acetate stencil and airbrush coloring with these frosting sheet stencils, you don't want to wait too long before you take them off because the spray imparts some moisture, which makes the frosting sheet stickier, which then makes it more difficult to get them off the chocolate. So I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm just going to take them off. And to do that, I'm going to take my trussing needle and carefully lift them without scratching the silvery area I just sprayed and without dragging them into that area because some of the spray is probably still wet and easily smudgeable. This takes a little while to dry. And ta-da, beautiful. So by trimming with modeling chocolate, here's an example of what I mean. I did this already to the domed part. This has been stenciled as I described. And I just trimmed out the base with a little bit of purple modeling chocolate and a ribbon of dark modeling chocolate in this case. And I'm just going to show you how that was done with the purple by wrapping the edge of this particular piece. Exact same process. Modeling chocolate works a lot like fondant, except my formulation here, which I made with a candy, with candy melts actually, or coating chocolate, is a little stickier than the version I make with real chocolate for whatever reason. I use the same ratios, but it's a little stickier and a little, much stickier than fondant. And so I usually have to apply more powdered sugar to it to dust it to keep it from sticking to the rollers of my pasta machine. And before you cut, just dust off any powdered sugar on top. I'm going to cut as much as I can. I think this full length almost will be needed to go around 5 times 3, at least 15 inches. So I'll cut 17 and hopefully that'll be enough. So I'm applying gentle pressure along the entire length of the ruler so that the material underneath, the modeling chocolate, does not shift as I cut. So generally the top of the ribbon looks the best, so I'm going to flip it over so that the top is exposed out once it's applied. And I'm just going to stick it down with a dab of corn syrup everywhere, the way I always apply ribbons to stuff. The first thing that I did, though, was I selected the front of my pedestal. I kind of thought this was the nicest looking side, and so I want to make sure my ribbon 
the midpoint of my ribbon gets anchored to the front so the seam is in the back. And I apply a little bit at a time and work it around so that I don't stretch the ribbon. And I like to do this on a work surface so that when I'm done I can set it aside for a little bit of drying before I pick it up and mount it because my modeling chocolate's a little bit soft right now. So where it begins to get stretched out here towards the end, I'm going to cut back because I know I have enough to make it all the way around to that point. I think it looks about as even as I'm going to get it. I'm going to put a few last little touches on this and set it aside to dry a little bit before we mount it on the, the dome part here. As for those last touches on top, I've got a little bit of lavender royal icing that matches the modeling chocolate band. I'm just going to put a few dots in some areas just to add a little more accent of color on top and to make it look a little less harsh. You could also use melted tinted chocolate for this but I happen to have royal icing on hand from another project. Chocolate sets pretty fast when you're piping on something cool and can leave peaks, so I don't often like those little peaks. So royal icing will most certainly not do that if it's at the right beadwork consistency. I want to talk about options for filling the fluted dome cup or not filling it for presenting it, if you will, before we get into decorating the top. And you have a couple of different ways you can go. What I'm going to be doing today is simply concealing some pre-made chocolates underneath the dome and not filling it, going straight on to decorating the top of it and just flipping it over and decorating it. Alternatively, once you've unmolded the fluted chocolate, you can also fill it with something luscious. I've filled mine with a chocolate mousse and then I set it back in the fridge to fully set and also because the mousse is perishable it needs to be refrigerated. So then you can invert that and decorate the top and place that on top of the pedestal as well to have a completely filled dessert. One note though in working with a perishable mousse is that in the refrigerator sometimes moisture can accumulate on the chocolate. It may not look as shiny as if it were unfilled as in this case. And that's because some moisture accumulated on the chocolate. I had this contained in a box, covered, and even so, my fridge is pretty high humidity, and so there's some moisture on there. If you don't like that, then the unfilled approach might be the better way to go. And inverting it to decorate it is as simple as just putting another cardboard on it, and then flipping it over, and you're ready to put decorations on top. I've got a perfectly unmolded dome here waiting to receive things on top. The goal is this little beauty right here to my left. We're going to be decking it out with a modeling chocolate rose that's been sprayed with a little bit of PME luster spray, some dark chocolate modeling chocolate bow loops, and also some textured leaves. The textured leaves were done by doing nothing more than rolling out a sheet of fondant and cutting them out with embossed plunger cutters like so, and then dusting them with a little bit of bronze luster dust to highlight the vein structure. And I'll be showing that in another video. I already demoed how to make little bow loops in my chocolate ribbon video, so check that out. This is the exact same process but with a very tiny ribbon. And in that same video I also showed how to make a really rough whimsical ribbon rose by rolling up a ribbon to create a fun rose. This is not that ribbon rose. This is a more delicate rose that's composed of nine to ten petals, and I will be showing in another video how to make that. When I arrange anything on just about anything, be it chocolate or cookie, I like to start with my largest elements first. This rose had a really big stem or foot on it, which I'm going to chop off. The beauty of modeling chocolate is you leave it to, leave it be and it sets up pretty rigid, but as soon as you start handling it, the warmth of your, warmth of your hand makes it moldable again. So it has some real advantages in sculpting and modeling that fondant does not, because fondant, once it sets, it's kind of set. It's hard to recover it. So I'm going to plunk my rose first and foremost, kind of, so it kind of leans over the edge and views nicely 
from the side because the dessert will be elevated about this, not quite this height, but a few inches shorter. So I want to be looking into that rose nicely and that seems to do the job. The next thing I'm going to do is situate some loops on there. And again, these are designed to kind of parallel the loopy pattern on the platter, if you will. And I'm mostly concerning myself with how it looks from the front. We'll get around to the back and try to make sure it looks decent from the back as well. I'm going to put another loop to the side just securing with a little bit of royal icing each time. And again, you could use melted chocolate for that. It's just a little bit harder to control the melted chocolate as it changes temperature and cools. Now it's time for leaves. I'm going to tuck one up, the big one up behind so it stands up as straight as possible. And the back, I haven't decorated obviously so that the back is as beautiful as the front, but if you wanted to, you could come back and place leaves facing this direction as well. I might just put a little one down here, but that's the, that's all I'm going to do. So I'm ready to put the pedestal together. This can be the trickiest part of the project, but it's actually not altogether too tricky. For this, I use, like to use a little bit of dark chocolate modeling chocolate to match the chocolate here, as well as melted chocolate for the glue. The modeling chocolate just gives the plate a little something extra to nest itself into and to give it a little more stability. Though straight chocolate could probably work too as glue. Now the chocolate will set really fast once it hits a relatively cool surface. So unlike royal icing, you have to move pretty quickly with it. So I've put a little melted chocolate down and my little bit of modeling chocolate to give some more stability underneath my plate. And then I'll need a little more melted chocolate on top to act as glue. And as I said, this sets pretty quickly relative to royal icing. So I don't have as much latitude in terms of how, you know, where I place it and how long I have to jockey it around before it sets. So I want to make sure before I drop it down that it's centered front to back and also side to side. So I'm kind of looking at it from both directions before I plunge it down. But you might want to keep fingers on it throughout the process until the chocolate sets completely. So we're almost done for my Valentine. As I said, I'm going to just put a few little surprise candies inside. So when they lift it up, they've got an extra special treat. You can also put your moose field dome that I showed earlier directly on top. And I've got two gorgeous fluted domes or, or lids, if you will, to choose from. But I think I prefer this one a little bit better because the, the rose is a lot bigger and I'm just going to cap it all off. So there you have it, a wonderful chocolate dessert from top to bottom that any Valentine would absolutely love. Happy Valentine's Day and live sweetly.